Hey everyone, it's Joe Moreau with Return of the King Podcast. I wanted to do a very brief reflection on a passage from St. John's Gospel that completely decimates the Protestant understanding whenever discussing sola fide, the Protestant understanding of, you know, once a person is saved, then good works will automatically flow from that person. This is an argument I'm positive, you know, we're all familiar with. If you're Catholic watching this, I'm sure you've heard this from Protestants. Uh, when, whenever discussing justification, whenever discussing the role, the relationship between faith and works, they will always say, well, once a person is truly saved, then the good works automatically flow. And then we ask, well, what if good works don't automatically flow, you know, after some period of time? And oftentimes what it boils, or what if the person stays locked into habitual sin that they can't shake from? You know, what if they keep committing certain sins? And then the Protestant, you know, will say, well, if such happens, they were probably never a true Christian to begin with. You know, why? Because their theology, the, their argument demands that good works will on, automatically flow out of the regenerate heart, out of the saved, uh, the saved soul. Okay. So in St. John's Gospel, chapter 15, verse, starting at verse 2, our Lord says, Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he will take away. And every one that beareth fruit, he will purge it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now I want you to focus right there at the very beginning of verse 2. Every branch in me. So our Lord is talking about, because he, he said he, he goes on to say that he is the vine, we are the branches, right? That's in verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. So in verse 2, every branch that is in me, he's talking about people connected to him, people in him, branches that are connected to the vine. He specifically says, every branch in me, so someone who is in Christ, that beareth not fruit, he, meaning the Heavenly Father, will take away. That passage, at face value, makes absolutely zero sense in the Protestant understanding zero sense it is a at face contradiction of what our lord is saying it's in other words it's turning our lord our lord's words into an a, literally an impossibility how can a branch be in him that does not bear fruit when every branch that's genuinely in him is automatically supposed to bear fruit and if it doesn't they say well then it must have never been in him our lord says every branch in me that beareth not fruit he will take away the Protestant argument says that that's impossible. You see? Because the Protestant says once you're saved, which to them means you're in Christ, once you're saved, you will bear good fruit. The good works will automatically flow. If they don't, you are never truly in him. That's the reason why Protestants that struggle with habitual sins, you know, or uh, after the emotionalism wears off, fall back into sin, they oftentimes you hear the stories of presents who go do altar calls over and over and over again to be resaved over and over and over again, right? But here our Lord says, every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he will take away. And then he goes on to say, every one that beareth fruit, he will purge it, that it may bring forth more fruit. So those of us that are in Christ that do bear fruit, we are purged. He is sanctifying us and making us holy. He's pruning us. He's purifying us. This also gives precedent as well uh, for the doctrine of purgatory. Okay. But point being, though, is that every branch that's in Christ that does not bear fruit, the Father will take away. Every, every branch in him that does bear fruit will be purged. This is also where we get the understanding of redemptive suffering as well. You see, because uh, what God is doing by the grace at work within us is purging us, right, purging the world out of us to conform us to Christ crucified, to make us more Christ-like so that we can imitate him, right? This goes right in line with the Catholic understanding of understanding of what we call infused righteousness. Does it, does it make any sense under the Protestant understanding of imputed righteousness? Okay, so that's one point. It goes on to say, verse 4, our Lord says, abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abide in the vine so neither can you unless you abide in me 
Verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same beareth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. Verse 6, If any one abide not in me, he shall be cast forth as a branch, and shall wither, and they shall gather him up, and cast him into the fire, and he burneth. So now... This is, you know, our Lord's getting very ominous. Now we're dealing with hell. We're dealing with the understanding of branches that were in Christ, but did not abide in Christ. You see, they did not abide. They did, they, they did not endure to the end. Do you get that? From, you hear that again from verse 6. If anyone abide not in me, he shall be cast forth as a branch. So again, this is talking about someone who was in Christ, but did not abide, and thus they're now cast forth from Christ. It says, and then they shall wither, and they shall gather him up, and cast him into the fire, and he burneth. Verse 7, if you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you shall ask whatever you will, and it shall be done unto you. Verse 8, and this is my Father glorified, that you bring forth very much fruit, and become my disciples. So the Father is glorified when we bear fruit, right? Our good works do bring glory to Almighty God. But notice that ominous tone in verse 6. If anyone does not abide in me, he shall be cast forth as a branch and shall wither. He shall be cast into the fire and he burneth. Again, this makes zero sense in the Protestant argument. Protestants will say, once you're saved, you're always saved. So how can you have a branch that's in Christ that does not abide in him when they say, well, no, automatically you will, you will abide in him. You know, some Protestants like to say about passages like this, oh, well, you know, for example, let me read this in verse 10. Our Lord says, if you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love. They will say, well, this is uh, descriptive, not prescriptive. That's a, a, a popular Protestant cliche nowadays. It's describing what believers do. In other words, believers will keep his commandments is what they say but our lord uses a conditional clause here saying if you keep my commandments if you keep them then you shall abide in my love and notice how he says it's about keeping the commandments that is contingent on the one abiding in him so we have to keep his commandments to abide in him that's verse 10 going back to verse 6 if we do not abide in him which would then mean we are not keeping his commandments which again, the Protestant says is impossible. So the good works will automatically flow. You're automatically, if you're regenerate, you're going to keep his commandments. But our Lord says, but if you don't, you will be cast away from me as a branch and you will go to hell. It says he talks about burning in hell. You will wither and you will burn. Again, the Protestant says this is impossible. You see, our Lord right here in the Gospel of St. John chapter 15 is completely teaching the topic that is the exact opposite of what Protestant theology teaches. It's right in line with the Christian faith, with the Catholic religion, the Catholic understanding of the doctrine of justification and the relationship between faith and works. But as it completely obliterates the Protestant position. So when a Protestant tells you, oh, well, you know, once you're saved, good works will automatically flow, point them to John chapter 15. Because again, our Lord says, every branch that is in me that does not bear fruit, the Father will take away. And then he goes on to say, if anyone abides not in me, if anyone abides not in him, he shall be cast forth as a branch and put into the fire where he, where he will burn. And he goes on to say, if you keep my commandments, then you abide in my love. You see the connection there between verses 2, 6, and 10. You see what our Lord is doing here, what he's teaching, what he's saying, very clearly, plain as day. And the Protestant says that none of this is possible. The, uh, what the Protestant, Protestant theology, uh, for what it is, completely contradicts our, word, our, our Lord's words and teachings right here from the Gospel of St. John, chapter 15. The Protestant theology starts with, you have to believe in Christ, accept him. And, which means you're in him, you're, you are now a regenerate soul, and you're saved. Once you're saved, you're always saved, you're eternally secure, 
And now this second process of sanctification happens where the good works now will automatically start to show. If they don't automatically start to show, or if they don't flow automatically in time, or if you find yourself trapped in habitual sin, then the question becomes, well, maybe you were never truly saved to begin with. But our Lord talks about branches that are in him that do not bear fruit. They did not bear fruit because they did not abide in his love, and thus these branches went to hell. And then he goes on to say that abiding in his love means keeping his commandments. You see, so that's right in the Gospel of St. John, chapter 15. Use this when talking to Protestants in sincerity to show them the fallacy of their theology, how it flies right into contradiction with our Lord's teachings in sacred scripture. And pray for Protestants to leave behind their man-made traditions to repent and convert to the Christian faith where they can receive the Eucharist, which is our salvation. And they can have their sins absolved in the sacrament of confession. Outside the church, there is no salvation. Our Lord has one church. He has one body. He has one bride, not the tens of thousands of Protestantism. God bless you.